I'm going to start for now. I quickly want to recap some of what, we, what was said last week. Who of you were here like last week? A number. Okay, great. It was a bit of a militant one. <laughs> but I, I'm wanting to build on, on what we have talked about last week, so it might be a good thing just to get a, just a, a head start on it. I'm quickly going to run through one or two things, and then we'll get on to the actual topic of this morning. So last week, I had a, the message was, a, was about the rules of engagement. It was pretty much about um, trouble. That part where Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, I think it's on there, it's John 16. It says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation or trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So this is a promise from Jesus that you will have trouble. <laughs> and last week we had a chat about how to deal with that, the rules of engagement. Um, I think James 1 might be on there as well. It was part of it. It says, James 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So this was the, this was, a recommendation for a three-point plan. Submit to God, resist the devil, and watch him flee. This is the rules of engagement. So just in short, I'm gonna build a bit on that. I think the same, the same things apply. This morning, I want to have a look at wilderness seasons. So I seem to have become the bearer of bad news. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm getting fired after this, so I'm just getting done with. <laughs> In any case, so by wilderness, um, I think a biblical meaning, whenever, or whenever you encounter something like that, wilderness might be the same as the trouble thing that we, we did last week. But th that was so last week, so this one, wilderness is a, is a, is a season maybe, Let's call it a temporary but prolonged season of reduced options and increased difficulties. So it's, it's the trouble thing, but you realize that there's a trend and it's coming from many directions at you. You realize this is something different. This is not the normal, have trouble by breakfast and figure it out by lunch. This is something that doesn't come through one person or through one entity or just because of the circumstances or just because of your finances or your planning or your, or your attitude or relational problems. This is something, something like a season and you realize this is coming all at once and from different directions. Okay, so this morning, what I would like us to do is is have a look at how to, how to walk through the wilderness. Because for, for most of us, it has already happened, maybe a couple of times, and it will probably happen again <laughs> for most of us. <laughs> now, there might be different cycles. If you look through a lifetime, like your life story, there might be places, one, maybe two, three, even, of large wilderness expeditions, like places where you went through major difficulties. And, um, and then there might also be cycles, shorter se seasons, which might be, might be minor. And um, I think this all, I think we talk about a wilderness just because of the way it relates to Israel, leaving Egypt, going through the wilderness into the promised land. So, this is more or less the pattern. There's the, there's the kingdom of slavery. Now, I call it a desert. I used to think when I was in school, when the Bible talks about wilderness, the picture in my mind is a jungle and a lot of monkeys. <laughs> I'm not sure. But that's maybe a more of a European way of thinking about that. And, and, and I thought like, yes, Lord, this looks like a jungle to me and there's a lot of baboons I want to get rid of. 
And if you look at, at the Bible, that's not a, maybe exactly what the picture is. If, if the Bible talks about a wilderness, there's not a lot of monkeys <laughs> and not a lot of trees. Uh, the biblical wilderness is a place of nothing, basically. It's a place of emptiness, like a desert. So I'm just going to swap the, the wilderness part with desert, just to be more specific about it. But the idea of a wilderness is that reduced options scenario. It's not the jungle, and there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of anything around. It's a it's a place where where all the noise and clutter gets removed, and you are you have the opportunity to be with God, separated. And that's why it's sometimes so difficult, because at first you don't realize where you're heading, but only you see only the doors are closing all the back doors, all the options you had to escape. And, um, and that's what makes it sometimes a difficult spot because you, you usually first see the doors closing and only a month or two after that you start realizing that this is actually a wilderness season. You can easily get derailed or distracted if you don't realize what you are dealing with. I think what one should keep in mind is the same that we said last week. We don't fear trouble for the very fact that, that it must pass over the, the um, God's table, in the sense it must be approved by God. He will never tempt you or test you beyond your ability. Same for this wilderness season type of scenario. Um, God must okay it, which means that it has been designed for you. You, you were given that trouble, test, or wilderness because you're fully capable by the grace of God to conquer it. So it comes by design. You don't need to start fearing it before you start believing the fact that, that you're more than this. This, thing, this thing's got its, got, it has got your name on it in, in the sense that you, are, you rule over that thing. Okay, but that's not, it's not always that easy. One thing to get distracted before you get focused. Okay, so in, a, in the wilderness, it's a place where you, it's basically you get reduced to strength in the sense that all the unnecessary weight that doesn't contribute to what God has for you in your life gets shed, gets thrown off, all the unnecessary things. That's, that's why it's a place of emptiness. Every useless thing gets sifted, removed. And, and that's why we, we usually get upset when uh, God start pointing us into a wilderness. Now, the reason we go through all of this is, is because God has, has something better in mind. This is a promised land. You can maybe just skip, skip two, two, three slides back. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a, a promised land. And the only reason we go through the wilderness is because God has something better in mind. You can't avoid all the, all the tests and all the wilderness expeditions, but not without missing your calling and your destiny completely. If, you, if you're ready to rule in the wilderness, then you're ready to live in the land of the giants. Um, but you first need to go through the wilderness. Okay. So there's a lot of the... It's the it's a, it's a lot of the same pattern here. Like we said, said, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Much like the same pattern. There's a place where you need to submit to the, to the promise of God. You actually need to have value for what he has for you. You submit to the promise. You resist the enemy in the wilderness. For all of that to work, you need to flee Egypt. The enemy is not going to flee you if you haven't fled that place. Otherwise, you don't have authority. You can maybe go two slides back. The first problem usually is a, is a what, is the, what is the promise problem. And sometimes we get stuck there. We need to start with what is the problem, uh, what, is the, what is the promise. Otherwise, the desert, the wilderness will make no sense. 
And this is something that God's need, God needs to settle in your heart. You need to know who he is. And if you listen to what he says, if you have value for what he has for you, then you will have a promise. You will, you will have a, a, a basic idea of where this is heading. Otherwise, all of the trouble and all of the difficulties, it makes no sense. If you're going nowhere, then why travel through a lot of difficult challenges? So, the second problem is usually, if you don't, if you don't know what the, problems, what the promise is, you, your, your second problem is a, is a why the wilderness problem. And one step back from that, it usually stems from a who am I problem on the slavery part. So, first need to flee Egypt. You need to know what God has promised you so you, you know why you go through the wilderness to reach the place of promise. Okay, so how do you inherit? How do you, how do you hear? How do you know what God has, has promised to you? How, do you? how do you receive that? What do you do with it when you have that? Now, that, I know there are people here that you know exactly, or at least you think you know exactly what God has for you. And then tomorrow God gives you something that <laughs> kind of upsets that. But, but there's usually this, this place on the horizon you're aiming for. You don't know what you're going to find exactly when you get there. But you have, a, you have a direction. You have a spiritual direction in which this goes. And the reason you have peace is because you, you trust the one that gave it to you. Your destiny is in his hands. That's the reason why you have peace, although you don't have details. I'm a detailed person. I like having the details. But I, that's not usually a strength. It's a bit of a weakness. What happens is if I have the details, I can judge whether I like this or not. I can judge whether this is a good plan or a bad plan. And usually God keeps the details from me. He placed the desire in my heart to have it, and then he, he created the need by not giving it to me. <laughs> so I am now dependent on him, which I'm also not used to doing like I, I don't like being dependent <laughs> but, but he knows how to work with us he designs the wilderness like he designed the promise it is tailor-made just for you <laughs> so there's there are challenges to this and we never have it figured out completely we might have an idea what the problem is what the promise is and i want to encourage you today if you don't have an idea, if you, if, you, if you find yourself somewhat restless and you think about where you're heading, what your destiny is, if you're uncertain, then at, at the very least, God has a place where you can settle and have peace over where this is heading. He wants to tell you. He wants to, he wants to show you what he's got, the promise. If you know what that is, it is a lot easier to face huge amounts of opposition, go through difficult places. The same trust that trusts the promise, trust the protection when you need to go through a difficult place to get there. And while we're at it, that same voice is the voice that, that's telling you who you are, that you are not a slave. So sons and daughters don't remain in a country of slavery. They leave. You need to know who you are. Even though it might carry you through a difficult place, at least you know where you're going to end up. So promises usually come through the written word of God. And, and, and if, you, if you don't feel you have, a, you have an idea what it is that God has promised you, I would start there. You can expect to receive supernatural word. You can even expect God speaking or, or right, like in an audible voice to you. But that might happen, but it will, yeah. If you don't have value for the written word as a foundation, the things that he has already given you, yeah, you probably won't have value the day when he speaks to you audibly. So I would start with the written word of God. There are so many problem, uh, uh, promises that's immediately relevant to you. Have a value for, for what God has already said so that when he adds something to it, when he sends someone to you, when he speaks to you, 
in any other voice that you, yeah, that you also have value for that. It is qualified by what he has already said. Okay. If you have no other promise, there's a, I would like to give you something, Jeremiah 29. That's a good place to start yeah, if you have nothing. And this is immediately applicable to you. We are the nation of God, the kingdom of God. Jeremiah 29, and this is in the context of God speaking to his people that he will bring them back from Babylon. And this is what he says, Jeremiah, you all know this verse, 29 verse 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans of welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. He's got that design for you. Now look, at it. this is not on there, but this is the rest of it. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I've sent you into exile, from the difficult places. So there's a promise. If you need a foundation, just something to start with, this is a good place to start if you need a promise. Okay, I'm quickly going to move on to, I wish I could uh, stay a little longer on some of these, but I would encourage you to, rather than taking one verse, just read the whole chapter, place it in context so you know what it's talking about. Don't cherry pick the thing until it fits you. Read the whole chapter when you have time during the week. Okay. So, it's difficult to submit to the, to the promise of God if you don't know what charge to obey or what, what guidance to follow. But if you know that's the promise, this is where you're heading. If you trust that, you'll trust the voice that tells you where to go as well. Okay. The next problem is why the wilderness? Let's, let's, put, let's put the word of God to that as well. There's a thousand reasons. For the same reason that that wilderness was designed, tailor-made for you, just like the promise was designed, there's a thousand reasons why you might go through the wilderness. This is the one that, this is one of the reasons that Israel went through that wilderness. Um, yeah, let's read from verse two. And you shall remember, this is in Deuteronomy eight, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So this is the reason he took them, to humble them. It's not that he didn't know what was in their hearts, but they didn't know. And, and that's, that's the whole thing. We all think we're always, we are ready for that promise. I've not met a person yet that, although you're a bit scared of what God has promised you, I haven't met a person yet that says, I'm not ready to take it. <laughs> we all believe I'm ready to take it today. <laughs> and, and, God, and God just smiles. He knows the giants will have the best of you if you take it today. And, and he's, not, he's not stingy or a spoil sport. He, he just doesn't want to get you killed. We all like a bunch of Jack Russells, and there's a ball. <laughs> and, and we want to chase that thing down right now. <laughs> Nothing's going to stop us. Even God has difficulty, like, keeping, keeping our focus. Just look at me. Look at me. <laughs> and and the, the same thing that's going to kill you there might kill you here. If, yeah, you know, we, always, we always seem to be faultless as far as, as we are untested. And this is the reason why Israel went through that. That they might be humble and they would see what's in their hearts. God saw it. They didn't. They thought they were ready. It is, a, it is less than a three weeks journey. If you quickly calculate it from Egypt to Jericho. A little more than 600 kilometers, six hours a day, you walk it out. It'll take you less than three weeks. Not sure if you're gonna carry all your stuff with, um, make it three weeks. It took them 40 years just because God said, the giants are gonna kill you if you go in this state. 
You think you're ready. You think you're ready. You're only untested. And this is the thing with the wilderness. Your attitude in the, the wilderness determines the length of your stay. So it's one thing seeing what the problem is. It's a whole different thing deciding what you're going to do about it. It's the same thing we talk about, talked about yesterday. Humility really gets you a long way. If you are humble enough to yield to God so that this can be fixed, then it remains a three-week journey. But if not, it might get like 40 years or 40 odd years, I'm not sure, around about a lifetime to get through it. So I'm just going to read a bit further. God, uh, God explains what he was doing all the time. It's not on there. But after that verse in Deuteronomy, he said, And he humbled you and let, and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make that he might make you know and that man does not live by, by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And it says that he gave them clothing, their shoes that not wore out. God had to take them to a place where they should know that even the food that they thought they need wasn't as important as the fact that they focused on, on God and on the presence of God. He, he had to take everything else away, all the clutter, all the noise. Just look, look at me, look at me. For them to, for them to understand this. And in this, his role was to, to keep them fully supplied, all their basic needs. It's just that they, they, they had to get away from the place where, where this was their primary focus. Their primary focus had to be God. And God will care for the rest. Um, so I would encourage you to go and read that whole part of it because God explains what he, he was doing while, while the nation was going through this wilderness season. He needs us to focus. So what Moses said is, and this is maybe the interesting thing, I always thought it was a bit odd when I read it in the Bible and when I was still in school. Um, Mo Moses said to Pharaoh, let, us, let, let my people go so we can go and worship in the wilderness. And I always thought that was a bit odd. <laughs> it didn't make a whole lot of sense. But we, yeah, in hindsight, what they did is, instead of worship, they went like complaining. Instead of praise and thanksgiving, they were ungrateful. In the place of worship, there was a lot of contempt and accusation. It was exactly the opposite. And um, a whole nation past a whole generation we rather say say this a whole generation passed away and there's something in there that that you would think wow this is a bit drastic but i think what we need to see is god is not in the business of eliminating people everybody didn't die the people did not die in the wilderness there were two people left joshua and caleb so not all the people died <laughs> But what did die was bad attitude. Sometimes we get so hung up with bad attitude, we're ending up in the same place that it ends up, and that's, that's going to die. But you don't need to, to bind yourself up with that thing. It's like that Jack, Jack Russell. Just forget about the ball. Forget about the ball. <laughs> if, you, if, you are, if, you, if you tie yourself up, with that thing, bad attitude, unforgiveness, hatred, stuff like that, you will go where that thing goes. Those things are heading for hell. You need to untie yourself quickly. It's like a ship. Don't tie yourself to a sinking ship. God is, God is not into the business of eliminating people. It's the last thing that's on his mind. If he, if he has other, any other choice, he'll be buying some time for them. Same here. God's role in Deuteronomy 8 is he's caring for them. He's looking after the basic needs. He's, he's feeding, feeding them all the basic stuff so that they can focus on them. The only thing they need to do is get rid of the filthy stuff. Just need to get rid of the wrong attitudes. That's the mission. And that's why it is, why it is important. 
the longer you keep yourself tied up with the wrong stuff, the wrong attitudes, the wrong inclinations, all that unforgiveness and, and uh, anger and stuff like that that's keeping you back, the longer the wilderness might be. God doesn't hate you. He hates that thing. And he wants you to inherit the promise. You need to rid yourself of that thing. You, he'll do the work, but you just need to let him do the work. That thing is not a treasure. And it's not valuable. You need just to put some distance between you and that thing so you can strike it. Okay. That, that brings me to the, the third part of it. Who are we? Because all of this is basically built on it. We have a destiny where we're heading. And we also have a calling. And our calling gets activated the moment when we know who we are. The moment when we leave the land of slavery. Our calling gets activated. The moment when we outgrow that old kingdom that, that doesn't fit. It, uh, it's almost as though our, our clothes and our shoes get too small. We have outgrown the limitations of a kingdom of slavery. When we see God face to face, we know freedom. We know love. And at that moment, our calling gets act activated. Calling is the way that it's, it's, it gets activated when we leave that land of slavery. Calling is, is how we carry ourselves through the wilderness. It's the way in which we do it. And calling is why we're heading for the destiny. That's, that's, the, that's why we're going to live there. Okay. So Romans 8, it's the best summary that I can get. But there are 100,000 places. If you don't know who you are in the Bible... There's 100,000 places you can find it, but let's pick this one. Romans 8 verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Pro provided that we suffer with him. In order that we may also be glorified with him. Okay. Can maybe put on that next slide. And the next one. Okay. You can maybe put on the next one. So we have the sons and daughters of God. Okay, it clips a bit at the bottom. It says, they leave, the sons and daughters of God leave slavery. And this is the second one that we thought of, we, we talked about. You need to rule in the wilderness. And that's basically over the mindsets and the thoughts and the circumstances. Actually, the only thing that you're fighting is the enemy. Uh, actually, God did all the fighting for us. But this is, the, this is the, the ways that he usually breaks into your house. Through the old mindsets, through the thoughts that he's bringing, through the circumstances. You can even, eat, you can even add to that people because sometimes he uses them as well. But our warfare is not, it's not against those things as much as it is against the enemy himself. So if you have left the land of Egypt, you need to rule in that wilderness over the things that are not equal to you. Every force of the enemy has been placed underneath our feet. We are meant to rule it. We need to learn to rule over it. And then the last part, this is the reason if we don't rule over the things that are set underneath our feet, we won't be able to reign with Christ. And this part here in the middle, the wilderness part of it, that's sometimes we, we stick around for too long just because we don't understand it completely. We allow the things, we allow our subjects to rule over us. We, al we allow things that, are, that, that have lesser authority than we do to rule over us for too long. And that's why we get stuck for way too long. That, that wilderness season is never meant to, it's, it's not meant to take a lifetime. It's meant to be quick. It's, uh, sometimes we just drag it out. And, and sometimes we have this little thing, feels like a little thing, and we're not taking it to God. We're, at first we're struggling with it, 
uh, at first we might even think it's, it's part of who we are because we don't know we're not slaves. It's part of who we are until, until we submit to the word of God and to what God says about it and we realize it's not part of who we are. And then maybe if we're lucky, we start battling this thing, if we move over to the next step. But again, we're battling this thing as though God has not conquered it yet. <laughs> and we, then we might even get stuck there for a couple of years, battling something that's already won. At least we stop partnering with it. And then after a couple of years, hopefully we hear God again, and we surrender to the fact that He already you already murdered that thing. <laughs> we just need to enforce the law. And then we, then we rule over it. This does not need to take a lifetime. You can be wherever you want to be. It all depends on how quickly you choose to obey. That humility thing that we talked about last week. Humility to submit to what God says. Submit to the promise. Just the common sense to resist the devil and not partner with him. And watch these things flee because you have authority over it. So I want to encourage you, if the Holy Spirit lays something on your heart, not to make God wait. Not to put your own reasoning with what God has already told you and is telling you. Not to reason with God. God does not need to be reasoned with. Be quick. If he tells you something, it's because he loves you. He's not going to steal anything good from you. He has something better in mind than what you have at the moment. Be quick. Listen. And if there's anything with you that's not a gift from God, God has already made provision to separate you from that thing doesn't want to take a shot at it at the moment because you are so, third, so closely tied up with that thing, it might kill you in the process. But if you can distance yourself a bit from that thing, you will give it a headshot. <laughs> you just need to decide that it's not something valuable you're going to lose. Okay? Sometimes it's not within your power if you have become a slave of that thing. And that's why sometime in, sometimes in your lifetime, you might have one or two big wilderness type of experiences but there will always be small ones because some department of your life might still be caught up in, in the slavery of Egypt and God just needs to free you from that as well. And there might be a bit of a small wilderness and that thing might not last five years, but it might last like two months. But it's still a hole you kind of fell into <laughs> and he just needs to free you. Sometimes there's something small and he wants to free you from that as well because you don't need slavery, but it might be a wilderness on your way to the promise. Maybe that, that thing you have with anger might be a wilderness to the place where you always engage with the freedom of joy where nothing upsets you. Maybe it's being impatient and he gives you all the patience in the world, but first he's going to test it un, almost un, up until breaking point. So that, that's never fun in, this, in the middle of it. But it's always a lot easier if you recognize it for what it is. Otherwise, you'll, you immediately start, you, you've got a head start and a bad attitude if you don't see it for what it is. So I want to encourage you next time, and, and this is, I want to I wanna say this as well, this is like in Job's case. Things go bad, and you have all these supposedly wise people doing a lot of talking, but they're talking nonsense and figuring out why bad things happen to good people, no? They're figuring out the, what the reason is that everything's going bad with Job, because obviously Job has done something wrong. <laughs> and I want to encourage you with this, that the reason you're heading into a wilderness season is probably not because you did something wrong, because, but because you did something right. You, you probably made a choice that looked a bit like leaving the land of slavery. Now you've got a target on your back. And the, and the enemy think he's destroying you, but God is actually just using him so that, that he can prepare you for the actual promise that he, have, that he, has, with, that he has for you. So I, I want to encourage you next time, 
when everything starts going wrong, just to have one clear moment where you realize what is happening. This is not by accident. There is no accidents in that. In that, It has been tailor-made just for you. There is no accidents that everything goes wrong at once, a difficult place. So the moment when you engage, rather than having another three months of bad attitude while you figure it out, this is what we do. What do you do when you have trouble? You get alone with God. Everything else becomes nothing. He becomes everything. That's why we need that wilderness place where we get shut in with God. And nothing else is more important. You are not more impressed by anything else. The moment when things go upside down, I want to encourage you, rather than starting to to produce a whole lot of talking and thinking and bad thoughts and terrible attitudes, ask God what is going on at the moment. And God will tell you, this is what he said. Ask me, call on me. I will answer you. You will find me when, you, when you're looking for me. That's a promise. That's also a promise. It's part of the problem and it's, it's got a promise in there. God will speak to you. You will save yourself months of bad attitude. You will save the other people months of bad attitude. And then you will save yourself years of, of trying to fix things that, that, that was already underneath your feet. Okay. So that's a big head start if you can do that. If the band want to come up, they're welcome to do that. So next time this happens and everything starts going haywire, you afford yourself one stop. Just get like have one moment of silence and start talking to God. This needs to be your way of life. This is not this is not what we do by exception. This is what we do, this is how we live life. If there's anything that you don't understand, then get alone with God in a place where nothing else is gonna matter more. So that he can pour himself into you. So that you don't you don't just know what you are facing, you, you know the promise where you're heading. You know what you've conquered because you know who you are. And if you have that mindset, then you will welcome. You will not go look for trouble and for wildernesses, <laughs> but you will welcome the enemy if you know that you will decimate them. They're knocking on your door because they're dead. You will, you will have a completely different attitude. What if you can go through life, the worst things? What if you can head into that knowing you already won. And it kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? We hear that a lot, but we don't do that a lot. We don't head into, into trouble smiling. It's because we don't believe it, isn't it? <laughs> Whoever believes it, he'll head into it with a smile on his face, okay? So how about that? That's the reason why we go there. That's the reason why we head into the wilderness so God can show you what he does to your enemies in the wilderness. So next time, you don't just leave with a smile, you enter with a smile. You know what happens next. You know what happens next. Those enemies, all those big things, so overwhelming, so impressive, it usually takes up, takes up God's throne and his seat in your life. All those loud things, all the noisy stuff, all the in-your-face stuff suddenly becomes this small because you're heading in there already, you already won. You're heading in there more than a conqueror. What if, what, if, what if that was your way of life? What if that was your, your habit of, of doing just because God has proven himself in the wilderness already? You, you're welcome to stand with me. I know, I know a lot of us have gone through this. We have gone through wilderness seasons. So you're not completely unfamiliar with what I'm talking about. All of us went through this. And I know some of us are going through it right now. And 
training doesn't seem like, seem like the nicest thing to do when you're already tired. <laughs> like right now, if you're already fighting this thing, and someone coming along that, that wants to tell you you need more training, uh, but you're already tired, <laughs> it does not help. <laughs> so I want to encourage you, do nothing. That's probably the best thing you can do, do nothing. Stop doing stuff. Shut yourself in with God. You do nothing. You open your ears, you do nothing. Don't chase that ball. It's just meant to distract you. You don't need to get any more tired than you are at the moment. So if you're in a place where you feel, usually it feels like you're getting stuck. It feels like a hole. It feels like all the normal options that you usually had at your disposal, all of that is gone now. All the normal back doors are closed. And every one of them you're trying, you find it's locked. Then it's probably God. And he probably has a great plan of where he's taking you. You might as well ask him what it is. But for right now, just to have you survive this whole thing and actually thrive in it, just turn your, turn your face towards God. Turn your ears towards what, what he is saying. Because there's not just a way of escape. There's not just a way of survival. There is a way in which you will conquer, thrive, multiply, just prosper in the wilderness even. That thing's not greater than God. It's only loud and noisy. But it barks a whole lot louder than it bites. We just need to look at the way we medicate our troubles. <laughs> this is God's best medicine. It's your prescription. You need a bit more of Him. So you need to go sit still and listen. Just one more side note. These things usually tend to separate you from people around you. Just because it's a wilderness and it tends to feel lonely, and God is bringing you to a place where it's only Him doesn't mean that you need to go and separate yourself from people. And what usually will happen is that the people around you would feel, would, would feel completely unequal to the task of helping you. It, it would seem as even their eff efforts would fail. All their normal, normal efforts of support would fail. That doesn't mean you need to shut them out. That doesn't mean that they need to go away. God knows how to design your wilderness in the same way He knows how to design your promise. You don't need to isolate yourself. You just turn all your attention to, to God. Keep the people around you. Your friends, they need to know what you're going through. Maybe your cell group, people that does life with you, they need to know what you're going through. And though all the practical help may fail or feel inadequate, they're still praying for you. They, they're reminding you of the goodness of God in the land of the living. And you need that. You need constant reminders because His voice comes from many different directions. You only need to distinguish that from the voice of the enemy. And your friends, yeah, they are your friends. They will bring you the voice of God and not some other rubbish. You need to hear that. You need, you need a reminder of who God is in that season. Because that season is not going to last forever. And it really doesn't need to last years. Okay, I want to read you one last thing. This is for me a good summary of what happened to Israel. This feels like more of the plan of God. It's in Isaiah. It's not up there. You can go read it at home if you want to. It's from verse 11. It says, Then you remember the days of old of Moses and his people. This is long gone, long after all of this happened. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea? 
with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit? Who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses? Who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name? Who led them through the depths like a horse in the desert they did not stumble? Like livestock that go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. That's where God wants us. This is our destiny, to reign with Christ in glory. Everything we do is meant to take us to the glory of God and to point the whole world towards the glory of God. So we don't need to get consumed with ourselves stuck in a wilderness that it feels like we have no direction. So I'm going to end this off now. But if you feel you might be a bit stuck at the moment in a wilderness like this, if you feel you need prayer, you're very welcome to come and, and, and pray with us. We, we'll be here in front. But I think you all have the weapons that you need to fight this war. Victory has also been placed in your hands. Okay. You have a reason to believe. You have a reason. And if you haven't, got any reason yet then after this season you'll probably have more than enough <laughs> okay i'm gonna end this off i'm gonna pray for us and you're welcome to grab a coffee afterwards okay thank you god for the fact that that you are a good god you have proven yourself trustworthy in every respect god have left nothing up to coincidence or accident God I thank you God that the one who has at the at the steering wheel of our life is the one who is capable and wise and the same one who loves us the one who wants us to go to a, a better place thank you God that you really care about us. Thank you. We have all the reason in the world to trust you with what you are doing, God. Thank you that we go from glory to glory, God. Thank you that nothing, nothing that crosses our path is greater than who you are is more impressive, is stronger, God. Thank you that you are beyond anything that we have ever seen, God. Thank you that if there is no trouble or problem that we need to figure out ourselves. Thank you, God, that there's no uncertainty as to whether we're going to make it out alive if we have our eyes fixed on you. So we pray, God, that you will intervene God and that you would consume and replace everything in us God everything that's unworthy God that that would be removed that you would that you would vacate every useless room every every thing that's of lesser value God every useless thought God and that you would replace all that we might have added through the years and you would fill it up with yourself God thank you God that we don't have to avoid difficult places and spaces thank you that we know how to handle it when we get there and I pray God that in Jesus name there will not be a single promise that is uninherited when you are done God that we would walk in everything that we have, that you have placed before us, God. Every last bit of it, God. And that you would have all the honor and all the glory. 
God, that, that the trust of, of your people will be worshipped unto you. That it would be a testimony of your faithfulness, God. That the world will see you for who you are, God, because your people trust you, God. And I pray that we would be able to walk it out in this world in that manner, God. That we, we would be, that we would walk faithfully before you in the face of, of even the worst things, God, that we could think of. That we would walk faithfully before you. I pray, God, for the strength to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, grab a coffee. You're welcome to come here front if you need to pray with someone and enjoy the week.